Yes, sir. Awesome. And, and like I said, if you guys have questions, feel free to, uh, to ask. So I'm, I came up with this really cool title. I'm pretty proud of it, right? Navigating the seven seas of design in turbulent times. Pretty exciting, right? Ooh, are you intrigued? Hopefully. Hopefully you are. Um, we'll get to those. But like I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off. Uh, Whitney, thanks for the introduction. And I'm proud to be a Jayhawk Rock Chalk. Um, I wish I was calling you from my uh, KU den back in my back at home. Um, I'd show you my Allen Fieldhouse starter set that I have in my, my office. But uh, right now I'm calling you from Denver, Colorado. I'm happy to tell you that uh, my family's here. Uh, actually, uh, we came here to see my son who graduated from KU with a computer science degree in May. And he's working here in Denver. And so we came to see him. Uh, I also snagged uh, my daughter who's working on her strategic communications degree and a minor in art. Um, and she joined us here from KU. Uh, she's a junior, uh, at, uh, or I guess sophomore going on junior um, at KU as well. So, and my wife is a Jayhawk. She's got her undergrad and her master's. Uh, we met and got married at uh, on campus there. So uh, real strong ties back to old KU. Um, one of the things that I guess from my brag sheet, uh, I am most proud of is uh, one, I uh, did start uh, into innovation um, as a consultancy. We'll talk about that uh, going on about 15 years ago. And also being the big player in IDSA um, and being recognized as one of the 50 most notable designers the last 50 years. Pretty exciting list to be on, uh, can't lie. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a real honor to be recognized in the industry. And also I received my fellowship in IDSA about seven years ago. So one of the youngest members of IDSA to receive my fellowship. So uh, it's good to know that I was able to snag that before I died. Um, so those are some things that I'm really proud of. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of those as we go along. Uh, into innovation, uh, if you guys, have you guys heard of us before? It's okay if you haven't, uh, I'm glad that you're here now. Uh, so into innovation uh, is, a, is a company, like I said, we're going on about 15 years and we call ourselves an experience innovation design agency. And what that means is that in today's world, we are not just a product design company. We are an experience innovation design agency. And our job is to create effortless experiences for brands. Um, and how we do that can happen in a physical way. It can happen in a digital way. It can happen in a product way. It can happen in a service way. And where we're really kicking ass is when we get all, all of them combined to make um, the ultimate you know, experience for the end user. And in the world that we're in, an end user can be a whole host of people and ecosystem for one particular experience we're trying to create. So uh, that's how it's really uh, propelled and advanced for us as a career from industrial design to an experience innovator. Uh, I'm gonna highlight a little bit more stuff about Into uh, just so we level set. Uh, obviously we just talked about Into Innovation. Uh, about six years ago, we launched a new brand called Project Bonfire. We had a lot of clients who were asking us, hey, uh, I know we call it, you know, you've been doing the fishing for us. Um, can you teach us how to fish? And so, because they're looking to try and change the culture within the company to become more innovative. And so we launched Project Bonfire. If you want to check it out, projectbonfire.com. But we actually now do um, courses in creative thinking, design thinking, um, uh, storytelling, a whole host of different courses that we teach. I'm going to talk about that today because of the pivots within the pandemic. Um, at one point, those courses were all uh, in person, and I'll talk about how we had to pivot and, and move to an online approach. And then another thing we're very proud of is INTO, if you're really wondering what INTO stands for, it stands for Inspiration and Integration. And my business partner, Ken Buras, and I have been together for almost, uh, gosh, going on 18 years. And uh, about nine or 10 years ago, we actually split the company into two. Um, into Innovation stayed on as the service agency and Into International is what we call our product and manufacturing sourcing group. And we actually have two offices in Asia, uh, one in the uh, North China and one in South China, where our clients will ask us just to continue on through and manufacture the product for them. And we will take care of that if they so desire. So some clients will do that internally and some say just keep on going. And so in that case, it allows us to be fully turnkey as a provider. And that again is uh, another challenge. Obviously um, we've got about eight people on the ground in China managing tools, piece part production, uh, logistics, all that fun stuff. But you can imagine how challenging that is right now in a pandemic and a politically charged world. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole nother lunch and learn. We'll, we'll talk later. <laughs> So um, when we talk about experiences, you know, back in the day, 
we would start immediately with our portfolio and go, hey, look at all the cool stuff we've done. Now, I like to start off the conversation. No, guys, these are the experiences we create. And one of my favorites is, you know, we, we've done things like um, extended power products in the home, things that plug into your power port. The, the reality here is the, the, you know, it's not about those cool things we've designed. It's about, you know, your family watching football on a Sunday afternoon and us getting out of the way so that they can have that effortless experience. Uh, I've, been, I've been able to design five fire trucks in my career. Uh, and I'm happy to say that was my thesis project at KU. And it turned into almost uh, kind of a micro obsession. And I'm um, actually considered the premier fire truck designer in the nation, which is kind of fun, uh, having worked for, for five different um, uh, brands over, over the years. But again, uh, as cool as that is, and as, as happy as I am about those accolades, the reality is it's, it's about making sure that, um, you know, an effortless experience doesn't have to be, you know, a super, you know, fun one either. It can be something that's very challenging or in this case, even traumatic, right. But we're, we're trying to get the firefighters that are safe uh, and, and, and prepared and ready to go uh, when they arrive on scene. And obviously, even if you're in a car crash, you're having an experience um, and you hope that it's as effortless as possible for you to navigate through that experience. So not all experiences are, are happy ones, but they certainly are uh, important that we have no glitches or, or, or hiccups, you know, in that scenario. And those are things, the same thing in oil and gas, right? We've done a lot of work in that field and that's not something you want to have. A, <laughs> you don't want to have a bad experience there uh, in, in an oil refinery. So all things like that um, are important that we recognize as we design these experiences. It's beyond just the, the metal and the plastic now. It's about the, the, the emotional state of the, uh, of the user. This has allowed us to get into a whole host of things. Uh, it basically breaks down into strategy and tactics. Uh, we do a lot of strategic work for our companies now. We do a lot of strategic mapping, uh, strategic, um, strategic uh, uh, pipeline road mapping, uh, lots of workshops, uh, modeling, concept modeling, ideation, and then obviously into the more tactical work of product design, industrial design, mechanical engineering, uh, UI, UX, and even in the manufacturing, as I mentioned. Here's our brag sheet when it comes to our client list. Uh, I'm, the reason I show you this is because you can see it's really diverse. And that's one thing I've loved about consulting in my career is that it's, a, it's brought us into everything from, you know, Hershey's chocolate to, uh, you know, Marriott hotels. So that's a pretty broad spectrum of, of opportunities there. And uh, finally, just on the N2 front, um, some of our claim to fame, um, if you got you guys Starbucks fans, any Starbucks fans uh, out there, um, uh, if you go in and you know the, uh, recognize the oven there, that was an oven we designed for Starbucks 12 years ago and is now considered the uh, best commercial appliance ever manufactured. And the same thing goes for the uh, gas pump here for Gilbarco Vita Root. I'm sure you've used this gas pump before. One we're very proud of is it's the best selling global fuel dispenser um, ever. So all things that uh, we've been able to design and have incredible longevity. And the reason I brag about them is because we were able to build in all this experiential design into the products, which have, have given it that kind of robust length in the industry. Um, but it can also vary. We also, if you guys have ever bought paint products from Home Depot or Lowe's, um, you're welcome. We were responsible for redeveloping the paint department of both of those retailers. The same thing goes with the uh, tool group, uh, tool world in Lowe's. So again, all stuff that applying the knowledge that we have in design uh, to a whole host of different operations. So uh, uh, one last thing to note, uh, it's allowed us to build a, a, a distributed model. Um, we've got four offices for Into Innovation. Uh, we're headquartered out of Dallas in Edison, Texas. Uh, we've got an office in the Flatiron Building in Atlanta. That's where we run the Project Bonfire Group. Uh, we also have a creative group in Austin at the Canopy, and we have a work center in Charlotte at the Abington Lofts. And uh, as the design geeks that we are, we have to make sure it's a cool, fun place to, uh, to hold an office to. So that's, that's the broad perspective. I'm going to paint you a, a more detailed perspective because this is the stuff I think uh, for you designers on the, on the call, uh, get geeky when you're like, show me some stuff, right? Show me some, show me some details, right? Uh, so I want to make sure I, I, lead, I, I provide that to you. So this is a detailed case study on experience innovation I want to share with you. you guys familiar with this brand? Does this look familiar to you? Interstate batteries. Um, maybe in your car, uh, if you've gotten your oil changed, you'll probably see the products there uh, in the shops. But again, interstate batteries, when you think about batter interstate batteries, you think about interstate batteries. You think of the batteries themselves. 
Uh, but one thing that is kind of cool is that uh, they actually about, oh, I guess more than probably about 15 years ago, they started designing their own battery testers so that the technicians could uh, test the batteries to determine whether they're good or bad or whether they need to be replaced inside the you know, consumer's car. And so they came to us a few years back and asked us if we would redesign their battery tester. And what was super fun about that request is that uh, we, had, we don't, hadn't done a whole lot of work with the brand, but the, the neat part was that um, we, we asked them if we could use our approach versus theirs. Cause at the time they were just like, we just need a new battery tester. They wanted a new product. And we said, can we take it to take this approach um, more as an experience design and less of it as a, just a product design initiative? And they said they were up for the task. So that's the story I wanna tell you guys as we kind of navigate here. So here's the result, I'm gonna jump to the end. This is the new battery tester that we designed for them. But there was a, an interesting uh, path that we got to take as we went along. And I'm happy to say this won a uh, design transformation award uh, just last year um, through a group called CMP. And uh, we're very proud of the accomplishments here. But this was a full turnkey initiative, uh, both physical and digital, uh, and entire ecosystem design that came with the design more than, like I said, than just the, you know, the, the, the shell aesthetics. Um, here's the, pro the new product in use uh, in, its in its natural habitat. Uh, but we got to redesign the tester, but we also got to look at the entire ecosystem of how this product lives and works within the environments and who and where it's touched by who, whom uh, along the path. I'm going to share that with you as we go along. So uh, to start, uh, we are big into ethnographic work and um, gathering insights. I'm a big believer in that we don't, we have to ideate with purpose. And in, in order to ideate with purpose, you have to have something to, to ideate from. I'm not a big plant, big fan of pizza parties. You know, everybody get in a room and let's have pizza and come up with some ideas uh, because that's just, that's um, way too Convergent, uh, we'll talk about that as we talk about the seven C's. Uh, we wanna diverge, we wanna be fueled with insights. And so uh, we believe that the difference between, you know, um, just, you know, tactical design and strategic innovation is we have to let the users in the field be our guide and be, we have to shut up and let them talk, right? And so I'm gonna show you some things that went along the way. Uh, we got to go around the nation and hang out uh, at these different locations with consumers. We got to do ride-alongs in the trucks as they deliver the batteries to the dealers. Dealers being, you know, uh, the, the, the actual shops where, you know, your car is worked on. We hauled batteries for days, which uh, is painful. Uh, the, uh, where they're stored, where the testers were stored, how they're accessed, how they're, how they're used within, obviously, the conditions of testing a battery inside of a vehicle or vehicles, how they're transported around the shop. Um, how these things are actually communicated with uh, or what, what the information is coming from these testers. All this information was being collected by our team uh, around the field. Uh, and then obviously, you know, the other thing is the habitat and, and the environment in which these products live. This is a pretty typical, you know, scenario that we saw. So it looks really, it looks a lot different, right? When it's in a spec sheet or on a, on a website or on a conference room table, but when you put it in its real, can you guys pick it out? You see it in there? Yeah, on the wall in the back. Yeah, back here. Yep. Nope, it's right there. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> On this wall. Yeah, that's it right there, right? So um, that's what we're really designing to and designing around, right? Uh, this is the world that we want our product to live in and find a way to properly live within this space because we can't change the space, but we can change this product to work better in that space. So. By collecting all that information, uh, I think we went to over 25 different sites uh, around the nation, but we also did a, uh, that was the qual work, the quant work was over close to a thousand uh, technicians. And all those insights were gathered. And this is the crowd, this is the Interstate Batteries uh, Brain Trust here. Uh, and we do a thing called the Frameworks and Clustering event, which is a huge submersive event. It takes about two days to go through all these insights We'll go into the details of that, but the whole idea is to extract out the insights and then begin our, our new ideation. I'll show you some, some of what that looks like. Um, in fact, if you look at the boards here, this board is kind of a pre-board where this is each individual intercept, each individual engagement is documented with photos and, and, and text on post-it notes. Um, and then all that stuff is regathered and clustered into new frameworks where we ideate in these frameworks. And so that's kind of a high level work, but there's a lot more to the, to the session. 
but the key part there is that obviously that's going to generate new ideas for us uh, and how we look at the problem. I'm going to share some of the details with you guys as we go along. One is that uh, when we looked at that tester, we knew there were a lot of data coming from the tester. What can we do with the, that information? We can provide it to the consumer via an app, which doesn't exist at the time. Uh, obviously, point of sale. Obviously, the data lake at the data center. Can we push that out and help the dealer communicate how to sell batteries better and how to communicate batteries better? Um, can that be done through new technologies and information centers where people can become more educated on batteries and why you need to keep your battery sharp and, 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 and charged in your vehicle? Uh, it actually led to a whole new way that the products were uh, positioned <clears throat> in good, better, best scenarios uh, and how we position them to consumer to professional uh, grade batteries. So we, it, it, it began to really expand and, and, and provide us a whole new host of, of um, ways of looking not only at the tester, but how products are actually viewed by the customer and the dealer. Uh, we started looking at how the top products within the ecosystem talk to each other, how they talk to the cloud, and how they talk to devices. So you can kind of see how this is all starting to kind of unravel and diverge into a whole new ecosystem beyond just can you design us a new tester. Here's some of the ideas as we move in from idea to concept, which are, I, by the way, guys, uh, uh, I know there are different, the, there's a difference between an idea and a concept. If you don't know that, uh, learn it. Uh, an, an idea is a thought, it's many ideas, but a concept is what it is and what it is not. We call it a, an idea versus the concept. So when we get to the concept, it is and is not uh, defined. That's how we look at the world. So over here in the ideas, these are all ideas that were actually being sketched real time in the frameworks and clustering event. Uh, these is the, this is as it begins to become more conceptual. Uh, I'll show you some more details of that. And obviously as it wor works into the final idea and mechanical design. Here's some uh, concept sketches. This is kind of the eye candy for the designers to look at. Um, this is from, from my team, uh, obviously looking at the different ways and orientations, not only the physical, but the digital, uh, beginning to look at the in, in involvement. Um, you know, this work doesn't change, guys. It's the same stuff you're doing in studio, right? Yeah. Quickly building phone core models, getting out there, testing the text. We made friends, let's get back in the shop. Let's go test them again. They're the experts, not us. Uh, so these are real world examples and just uh, the same stuff you're doing. So, you know, if you're doing these things, then keep doing it because this is what we're doing. Um, so that, that's kind of move, starts moving to the tactical execution, right? And then here's the journey map that came from it. But you can kind of see with the tester sitting in the middle, obviously there's the consumer and the things that in the communications we could convince, talk to them. Obviously it even gave us the opportunity to build a, a, a new uh, way to communicate to the, the consumer and they can keep tabs on their battery, just like your Fitbit can keep tabs on you. Uh, we can keep tabs on your battery and make sure the health of your vehicle is top notch. Um, obviously the technician and the, and the way that the products are actually sold and communicated and obviously the distribution and the data that relates to back to the company. Uh, all that got tracked. Here's some detail shots of the final solution, both the physical and the digital work. If you're curious, this actually is an Android touchscreen, but we actually do have a directional keypad as well. And the reason for that is in our testing, we found that a lot of these things are tested outdoors and a lot of the, the technicians are wearing big gloves and uh, they didn't want to take their gloves off while they're doing the testing. And so that's why you see two ways of uh, engaging with the product. Uh, the other thing that we're really proud of is that none of these products in the, in the marketplace, there are competitive products. Everybody just said, oh, it's a tester. And nobody gave a crap about the clamps and how they were dealt with. And so we, put a, we built a whole clamp program, redesigned the clamps, and even how the clamps are, are, are actually what we call the cradled. And so you can kind of see there's these holsters for the, for the so everything is contained. And so now it can move around the shop a lot easier. And one of the big problems we were finding is the tester was pretty durable, but the clamps were, were not. And so when the clamps broke, uh, they had to send them back into uh, basically interstate battery to have it repaired. So not only did we protect the clamps better so they wouldn't break, we also put in quick disconnects. So if they were to break, they could send out just some new clamps, pop them in and keep going. Because anytime this tester is down, then they're losing sales and opportunity with the consumer to make a connection with the experience. And again, the hope is that we have a win-win, a happy customer and a happy, happy dealer. It also led, as I mentioned, to a complete redesign of some of the battery casings and the way that the product is named. We actually renamed the products, um, went with a new naming uh, structure. 
that was more clean because we found that that was confusing to the consumers when we were in the field. They didn't understand what the difference between an MTZ and an MT5 and an MT was. Um, we designed new kiosks uh, that actually were deployed inside of uh, you know the dealer lobbies. And we actually got to redesign the shelving units in which the batteries were um, housed on. So again, built a whole new uh, platform and product pipeline for us, not just the, the tester itself. So that's the case study, guys. What do you think so far? How are we doing? That's awesome. Yeah, we having really fun? Very... Cool. Yeah, this is incredible. This is really awesome. cool. I'm glad you guys are liking it. Um, it is cool, isn't it? Uh, it's a lot of fun. You guys have been doing this 32 years, and it's a lot of fun. It doesn't get old. Uh, <laughs> I lost my hair a long time ago, but I tell you, I, I saw, it, keeps, it keeps me as young as I can possibly keep, stay uh, with, uh, with, with, the, with what, you know, uh, the, you know, the energy you can get from, from these kind of initiatives. So that's the case study. Uh, do you guys have any questions about that? Um, I'm curious about the, the timetable. Like how long of a, of a project was that? That's a great question. Um, one thing that I'm a huge geek on is project management. Uh, in fact, my job uh, as the president of the company, I quote every project for the, for the company. Uh, and the reason for that is I want to know what we're committing to. Uh, and projects like this, that can take up to 12 months. And mm -hmm. um, especially when you add in all the, all the uh, research and all the conceptualization, we had to work, we worked with another uh, technological uh, tech engineering company out of Chicago that had some of the battery testing technologies. Uh, so we had to integrate with them as well and, and, and make friends. Um, so that all was in part of the program, obviously, uh, getting out there in the field, uh, you know, the research initiatives usually take about three months. It takes about a couple of weeks to even get our plan down. It takes about three. We had to recruit. We actually recruit them. It takes about three weeks to recruit the actual, uh, intercepts. And then it takes us about three to five weeks to get out there and do the work. Uh, and then it takes about another three weeks to convert it to the insights of the ideation. So that whole front end strategic piece is usually about three, four months. Uh, and then you have the big block in the middle, right, which is the tactical design and engineering initiative, which is about three to four months. And then we have about that whole block on the backside where you're, we're actually doing the integration part and the actual production work. Uh, so th what was pretty exciting is we were able to turn this entire redesign uh, and ecosystem build out in about 12 to 14 months total before the first products were actually being field tested. So we're really proud of that. That was one thing that was also very important to the client is that we Believe it or not, that's a pretty fast timeline. When we asked them originally how they did those originally, you know, they said, oh, it takes us a couple of years to build a new tester. And we're like, okay, well, that's not gonna happen. Uh, we gotta move faster than that. So, um, but all that for our world, uh, we're gonna talk about as we get to the seven C's, very, very process specific. Um, everything is detailed. Uh, every, every step is quoted uh, down to the hour and tracked down to the hour. Mm -hmm. um, that's a whole nother lunch and learn if you guys wanna know. Uh, maybe Whitney will invite me back and I can give you a, project management class. Um, it's a whole nother world I can share with you, but it's pretty intense, but we track every hour on the project, but that's about a thousand dollar project too, um, plus or minus. Uh, when I just off the cuff, this was back, we did the work back in 2018. So uh, I'd have to go back and look at that, but um, maybe even a little more, maybe about 1200. But the, uh, the cool part is that uh, uh, those projects usually turn about a year. Okay, cool. Any other questions? What's yeah, um, a, oh, oh. yeah, go ahead, guys. Someone else say something. All right. Well, I have a quick question. Um, it might be going off on a bit of a tangent, but um, with something like as in depth as experience design, um, and with such like a reliance on the user, how um, how do you go about at least like currently with the pandemic? How do you go about that interaction with the uh, with the users now? Oh my gosh, That's Matthew! Three months research period, I, I swear I did not text Matthew and ask him to uh, to ask me that question. Um, that was all improv there. That was all him. Uh, Matthew, welcome to the seven C's of design. Uh, awesome. That's the, the second half of our conversation here, and I'm going to answer that question directly for you because it is a different way of doing it now. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the, the highs and lows of that, but uh, one more thing about me that you guys will geek out about this, hopefully. Um, so I, I, I'm one of those fortunate ones. I learned about industrial design in junior high. No lie. I, I don't know how, but I know I'm rare. Most of you guys find out about it much later, probably in life, or you're getting into architecture and you go, oh, wait a minute, what's that over there? What's that studio, right? 
I've heard the stories a thousand times over. Um, we're just glad you're here. Let me just say that. Even if you're in architecture or you got someone is online with architecture, we, we you know, we're, we're all uh, part of the big family, but um, uh, you know, I found about it very early on and I knew I want to be an industrial designer since ninth grade, eighth or ninth grade. Um, so uh, I actually transferred into KU in 88, in January of 88, which actually was an amazing time to transfer to KU. If you know the uh, historical significance of January 88 was when we went on our magic round with Danny Manning to win the national championship. Did not suck uh, to come into that, uh, to come to campus on that, on that time. That said, um, back in 1986, I'm starting to date myself, uh, there was this magazine called Design World. It was from Australia. It won the best design magazines ever. It's no longer in publication, but it, I, I, I've hoarded every issue. Uh, they're awesome. Um, and on the back, it obviously, if you recognize that, that's a, an ad for Frog Design and the Apple II, I think it is, maybe, or 2C or something like that. And it was my first introduction to, um, to uh, industrial design consulting. And they had this article on industrial design consultancies. And I'm like, what the heck, right? I just knew industrial design, big, big ID thing, right? I'm like, what the heck is this? And so I started looking and I'm reading and I'm reading and I come across this, these guys here. I'm not sure what it says, design field or something. But uh, the significance is this picture right here, right? And I'm like, I want to be that dude. That's, I, I, want, I must be this dude. I, this is, I've got to be him. That, that I now have my new hero in life. Uh, little does he know, he's in a, behind a drafting table in uh, somewhere in Australia. Uh, but I'm not lying. I'm like, all right, I have I have the model in which I will uh, uh, build myself around. And if you guys think I'm kidding, this is a picture of my design studio in my apartment at KU. Uh, and if you notice, I think we have pretty close to matching Nikes there. Um, and I, I will not lie, I have this sweater or had that sweater. I, uh, not sporting it here, but by golly, uh, I, uh, I actually had that sweater. Um, yeah. I'd just like to say I have the same poster in my room. Sweet. Sweet. Look at that. Way to go, Seth. Oh, oh, That's look at that. <laughs> Virtual high five, bro. That's awesome. That is so <laughs> very cool. I can't tell you how excited I am to see that. Um, maybe even the same one. Maybe, maybe it's, it made its way to you somehow magically through the magic, maybe at the love garden or something. We picked it up together. Um, but, uh, and of course, you know, uh, Seth, do you got a stack of markers behind you? I got to see if you. <laughs> I'm, working on, I'm working on my collection still. All right, very cool. Got some cool grays. Very cool. Uh, so yeah, this is this is me at KU, uh, and and I still have that drafting table, and it drives my wife nuts. She's like, "Will you ever get rid of that?" And I'm like, "No, no." Uh, but here's here's the seven C's. Um, Guys, I'm going to throw them at you, and then we're going to go through these uh, independently. But here's your seven C. These are the things I wish somebody would have told me when I was in school. Uh, creativity, curiosity, confidence, commitment, communication, collaboration, connection. And we're going to talk about each one of them separately, right? But I'm, and the, way, the reason I came up with this list, and I swear to you, I came up with this 24 hours ago. Uh, I built this for you guys last night. Uh, in fact, me and my daughter, we were walking the streets of Denver yesterday, and I said... She's, I said, you know, she's halfway through her KU career. And I'm like, I'm like, Anna, what, what, what's a, a group of, uh, of uh, design students want to hear from an old dude like me? And she's like, dad, just tell them what, you know, they need to know. And I'm like, okay, I'll tell them what they need to know. So here's what you need to know. And you can go tell Rance Lake, uh, 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 I gave you this information. Uh, uh, Lance Rake, I said, Lance Lake, uh, go tell him I, I gave you this information. Um, creativity, let's talk about this. All right, uh, and I apologize for the, uh, you, now, you, now you're gonna get a couple of, uh, you know, uh, Shutterstock images, so sorry, bear with me there. I couldn't get everything uh, real for us in short order. But uh, creativity, so what is creativity? And I, and I got some notes here I kept because I, I just wanna make sure I don't miss anything. Do you guys know, um, there was a test done uh, not that while, a while back and 1600 people were actually interviewed for this um, at different age groups. And they were, they were testing for creative genius. 
And you know, at, at age three to five, do you know how many people tested for creative genius? How, what the percentage of those people that were tested at ages three to five actually ranked as a creative genius? I'd guess 70%. Good call. Actually higher, 98%. Um, as, as we move on through, uh, and again, I got some notes here because I want to make sure I didn't screw it up. Age eight to 10, where do you think that one hit? Let's go with 32%. Age 13 to 15, 10%. Over age 25, less than 2% of people are recognized as a creative genius at your age-ish, right? Guys, the world needs creativity. Um, we're finding a lot of it is compressed. Uh, I always tell the story that, you know, that a lot of us, a lot of us on this call, we made it through the gate somehow as creatives. Uh, but, you know, back in the day, people are like, stop drawing on your notebook and pay attention, right? Um, you know, what are you doing over there? You know, what do you mean to be a starving artist, sell your paintings at Holiday Inn or something? I mean, you know, all those things we've heard. Uh, but the, the world needs more creative geniuses. And, and I'm assuming I'm talking to a whole host of them right here on this call. Because usually what I find in the ID track specifically is uh, all of you are the ones who kind of make it through to like hell or high water. I'm going to do this and I'm going to be a creative, you know, professional. And um, so it, it's super important that, that the world needs it. I can tell you guys, we're actually as a business, we're doing just fine. Our clients are coming to us and going, we are in desperate need of creativity in this company. And we're talking brands that you guys all know and love. Um, it gets really thin behind the screen when they start talking about uh, how challenging it is in the world of creativity. And, and again, if we had more time, this, this, this hour goes by fast. If we had more time, we'd talk about the difference between divergence and convergence. You guys have probably all heard that term. Well, you guys are all divergent minded folk, right? That's usually what creatives are. And I'm going to stereotype. The majority of the world is convergent minded, right? And that's where a lot of the engineering base comes from. And, and thank God engineers exist, right? And they're very important, but a lot of companies, yeah, my wife's in the background, by the way, is an engineer. You heard a woohoo, a shout out. Um, uh, what happens is in, in, in the world of, 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 of um, business, they hire convergent minded people. And, and the whole idea is, you know, I need you to come in with your knowledge and get us to the point, right? Get us there faster. And so they're, they're, they're actually asked to get to converge. Meanwhile, we come in and we're just like, wah, right? And we go wild and, and wide and wild. And and, and sometimes the world's trying to figure out who are you, right? And, but the reality is those that really understand the value of what uh, designers and creatives bring to the table. And once you've learned how to weave, the, weave that fabric, it's an amazing opportunity. Now, um, in the world of creativity, obviously, uh, we would say that the, uh, the uh, most, uh, you know, uh, the icon of creativity is probably the post-it note, right? Um, that's usually where all those things start happening. I wanted to tell you that in our world, uh, so absolutely, right? I, 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 I probably bought more post-it notes, um, string them together, go around the world kind of thing, right? Uh, but in today's world, um, I'm gonna start giving you guys uh, a sense of this. We do this all day long, right? This, and you, are, you have it as well in your studios, but it's very common for us to have a session like this any day of the week where we're on the board together, a whiteboard together, doing something like this with our post-it notes. Today's world, I'm going to pop up and do a little pop up for you. Have you guys heard of Miro or Miro? If you yep. haven't, um, I, I'm assuming you guys probably have. The world hasn't necessarily outside our creative confines, but this is a place where we're seeing um, a lot of opportunity. Uh, we can't function without this. We use both Miro and Miro. In the, I wish they weren't named so closely together. We were using Miro when it was called Real Time Board, and now it's called Miro. But in like, it sounds a lot like Miro. We should call it that, but. Uh, we're doing a lot of work here and uh, it's, it's incredibly collaborative, but a lot of businesses don't even know about this tool yet, but it's uh, we are, we are, we are just shifted a lot of our movement from the whiteboard physically to the, to the Miro virtual board. So if you guys are familiar with this tool, keep using it. It's not going to go away. Um, it's awesome. And uh, I highly recommend you continue to, to, to focus on that. But don't forget the world needs more creatives. So keep your creativity, um, you know, sharp. Uh, I'm going to move fast because we don't have a lot of time. So to get through our seven C's, but the next one is curiosity. Uh, guys, 
if this is what you need to be a, to be a designer, especially if you want to move from a tactical designer to a strategic designer, you have to sharpen your skills and curiosity. You don't have a choice. You have to remain curious. The moment you do, um, we, we're going to lose you as a, as, a, as, a, as a leader in this industry because we have to keep challenging the world and asking new questions and being comfortable in a room of our peers going, you know, I just have to ask a question. I got to know um, why. And people are like, oh, no one's ever asked that question. Why? Well, it just is. And you're like, well, my job is here to ask why. And then once you answer it, I'm going to ask you why again. And I'm going to ask you five times over what why is. And I'm going to get to the point where you don't have the answer. And the reality is now it's our turn to say, this is what we need to go solve in the world. This is why we need to apply our practices and go do what we do from our ethnographic studies and our, and our, and our qualitative initiatives to go out there and find new opportunities and go talk to the people in the ecosystem and say, guys, we are not the expert. You're the expert. You always get to lead. I've been doing this for 32 years and I'm never the expert. This when the day I claim to be right is the day I'm done. I have to trust that the, that the people in the ecosystem we're designing for will give us the answer. All we have to do is come with a sense of curiosity um, and, and be comfortable asking the question. And I can assure you, gang, we're in the minority. It's why I get paid pretty good money to go out and ask questions of brands, customers, because they don't actually talk to them most of the time. They'll talk to them through quantitative means. They're happy to send out surveys. Yeah. They're not very comfortable going out and talking to people in their homes or businesses. That's what our team does because they're like, oh, you'll do that for us, right? And we're like, yep, we'll do it. Um, pay us, right? Uh, to answer the question, Matthew, I think you might've asked it. I'm not sure, uh, maybe it's a big question, right? How do you do that now? Welcome to the world of Zoom, right? We, we just finished a huge study for a major brand uh, in, the, um, in, in basically the uh, household cleaning space. Uh, we went into 25 homes and we did it all virtually through Zoom. Now, there are a lot of tricks that you have to play there because when you're doing ethnography, you have to, it's not about just having the conversation one-on-one -on -one with the, it's also about what can you study about the environment while you're there, right? What pictures can you snag about their pets and their, pictures and their house and their way they live and how they stack clothes in the corner and all those things matter when you're when you're doing your ethnographic study um it's harder to do that when they're in control of the camera right uh so we you have to start learning new methodologies to say um there are different processes that we have to take uh the other thing we have to have is we actually have when they're doing the videoing for us we actually have somebody on the call that actually is doing nothing but screen grabs. And then we run it through a filter that actually converts those to photos for us so we can get them up on the wall. Uh, the other thing we're doing, there's a new product called Reduct, which is kind of pricey, but it's super cool. Reduct um, is a tool that will take the video portion from Zoom. Uh, and it, what it does is it converts, it, it splits the, analog, the audio and the video. The audio portion is then transcribed word to word. The video portion then is, is actually positioned so that they match it back up with the transcription. And we can click on any word in the transcript and it'll take us right to that part of the video. And we can highlight sections of the words, then it will highlight that section of the video. And we can go through all the text and then we basically can render out a, a video of just the highlights of that two hour conversation. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty pricey, um, but it's worth, it is worth the spend for us because then we can do, uh, we can basically create real time videos on the fly uh, and then provide those back to our clients. So one thing that's pretty cool about this, which I wouldn't have guessed, this is one of the interesting learnings and positive things from a pandemic, which it's hard to find in this world to find positive things for a pandemic. But one of the things that we found is that by doing this, by these uh, by doing the virtual ethnographies versus we were, we are so big into in-person. We, you know, I fly my team and I fly, I, I'm an I'm executive platinum on American. I've been on, I've been that way for years because I do a lot of flying. I personally go into a lot of these homes and businesses. Um, and so does my team. Uh, we're very big into it. It's just how you, we got to get in. Right. Uh, but in the world of, of a pandemic, you can't, or you're not allowed to, they don't want you in their home. Um, nor do we want to necessarily be in there for them, for their, for everyone's health and safety. Uh, but one of the things we found is that we spent a lot of time on airplanes moving around the country. 
when you're doing it virtually, we can hit two or three in a day right from our desk. And in fact, you know, their projects will have over $50,000 just in material charges alone for travel. And here you're like, guys, let's take that $50,000 and actually convert it to more intercepts. So now we can actually go out and do more in-home work, right? Uh, and, and still use the same budget. That's actually a positive that's come from it. And like I said, finding positives in a pandemic is kind of hard to do, but that's something that's been, been actually interesting to happen. Um, the other thing we do is we, we, we spend more time prepping and we have the, we have the uh, maybe the homeowner in this case, they have to do some more video logs for us. They have to do some video. They have to take pictures of their, of things that we ask them. So we give them a list. Can you go take these pictures for us? Cause these are pictures we'd take if we were there, but we're not going to or can't. So can you send them to us? And that's one thing that we've actually found too. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. It's a little bit of background on, on some of the things with, with that. Confidence, number three, checking my time here. Um, guys, the world also needs you to be confident in what you do. I'm getting a lot of people. And in fact, a lot of the questions start with, Brian, we need to get into the field. How do we do that? We don't have the confidence even within the brand to know how to do that now. Do you guys, can you tell us how to go do that? Can you help us go do that? And we have to be confident in how we, how we, how we go forth and do that. Um, the other thing that's, that, that's had interesting on the confidence front is uh, when it comes to our Project Bonfire brand, we were doing all of our training in person. We'd actually fly out to the businesses and the corporations and we'd set up in a conference room and they'd bring in 20 folks and we'd do a one or two day event. Well, now that we can't do that, right? In fact, in a lot of the businesses, the, the, we can't even get into the, get in the doors. Um, so we had to move all this. We had to pivot and move all of our training online within literally a matter of months or we would have lost the open or POs that we had with these corporations uh, to do the virtual training or to do training. So we moved it all virtually. And one way we did that obviously is using Zoom, but then we also deployed a couple of other tools. Uh, Mural is big and do it. And, and the reason we use Zoom, guys, I've been using GoToMeeting for over 20 years, but the reason Zoom has become popular for us is because they're the only tool that we know of outside of Microsoft Teams that allows us to do project or team breakouts. And we can break them out and then we can bring them back together again. And just like we would do in a real world scenario, we'd break them into small teams and put them in the corners and have them come back. We need to be able to do that virtually. Because our belief is that we're designing, remember, I'm talking about being experienced design, our, I can assure you our design, uh, our, our, our project bonfire is an experiential training course. It's not just to sit down and you know learn. It's gotta be very experiential and engaging and collaborative. And we had to create the same type of virtual experience as you would have as a physical experience. Uh, we also launched a project called Intrepid, which is a, is a uh, basically it's an online uh, learning tool uh, platform. So we mixed Intrepid, Zoom and Mural together and that's one way we're achieving uh, our online training courses today. But that was a big pivot we had to do. And it took a huge initiative on, on our team's part to convert all that to an online experience uh, real time within a matter of, you know, like I said, months. Uh, so we didn't lose our momentum with our, with our clients. So that's the world of, confi uh, of confidence. But again, um, I, I guess the other part about this is, you know, a big question for you guys is, you know, uh, can you deliver on what you say you're going to do? If, if you say, I'm, I'm, damn it, I'm a designer and I can do this, you better deliver it because people are, they, they've got to let out what I call longer leash, right? That trust leash has got to get longer because you can't, they can't, they can't monitor you real time. I'm not in their offices every day. I'm not, you know, I can't come out and see them every couple of weeks. So they're trusting you that you're accomplishing the goal and they have to have confidence in you and you have to have confidence that you're, you're able of accomplishing the task. This is another one, uh, commitment. You guys, you know, there can be a lot more people on this call, but they're not. I will remember every one of your guys' names um, because you guys are here, right? Congratulations. Um, there's no reason for, uh, I'm guessing there's more people in your class. I don't know why they're not here. They probably have a good excuse. Uh, it's snowing outside, whatever. Um, you guys are here, they're not. I will remember your names. I will not remember theirs. So it sucks to be them. Um, and I'll, Cause I'm gonna tell you about number seven which is super important. But uh, when it comes to commitment it's be committed more than you've ever been. Uh, stay in the game, get in the game, be in the game, work harder than everybody else. Uh, and good things will come to you. Um, and I gotta tell my team this every day. Keep it up guys, don't lose faith, stay in the game. 
Um, I know it's hard, you know, pandemic sucks, you know, we just want to boot kick COVID, you know, so hard and so fast, you know, so far, but we can't, and it's here and we just have to deal with it. Uh, the political, you know, ramifications we're dealing with right now in our country and all the things that come with that, right? It sucks, but we've got to stay in the game. We've got to stay committed and, and, and build and be stable um, where others just can't. And this is what we also, as consultants, the people are, are our brands and our, our, our partners are relying on us to go, you have to stay level head for us and stay in the game because all hell's breaking loose around us, right? And so we know that you are in the, doing what you need to do for us while we're over here trying to figure out everything else. Um, so that's about, the other one is just in that area, do you have a plan, right? Do you have a plan? That's what happened this, you know, you know, no, we didn't have, you know, our, our customer, our, our, our employees came to us and said, what's our COVID-19, you know, uh, you know, execution strategy. And you're like, okay, that's not one we wrote for the employee handbook, but by golly, I called the leadership team together. I'm like, guys, looks like we got a long weekend ahead because come Monday, we've got to give our team a COVID-19 response plan, right? And our clients are going to ask, how are we working now, right? And I better have an answer, not, yeah, I'll get back to you on that, right? I have to be confident and I have to be committed to staying in the game. So make sure you've got a plan because if you don't, uh, they'll call you out for it. Uh, just a side note, I popped this up for you, kind of fun. <laughs> We just did a massive uh, frameworks and clustering event uh, for a client uh, a few weeks back. And they did ask, they wanted part of, they had uh, about seven folks they said they wanted to have on face-to-face. Uh, -face. They're like, we want to do this in, in person. And then there was, they said, we got a, a handful that want to be doing it virtually uh, and, and don't want to come into the office. And we had to have a plan for that. How are we going to run a hybrid event? And we better know how to do it and we better be committed to it. Now, this is virtual Dave. Dave's our creative director. He's been with me for close to 13 years. Uh, Dave could not attend. He's the one that ran the research initiative for this program. But the problem was is that Dave uh, has two young children in school. And if he were to actually attend in person, he would have to quarantine with his children for two weeks out of school. So we're like, well, Dave, you can't be there. So we built virtual Dave. And so we went out and bought all this. We bought this gantry. We bought the, the, bought the TV and a 50-foot extension cord. And those are my shoes and shirt there on Dave. Uh, but we rolled Dave around, right? And so Dave, that was our commitment. We're like, yeah, we got this. Uh, we can run a hybrid event. And then you go and you do it. So that's virtual Dave. Uh, on the communication front, um, the, I guess the piece here just to highlight is uh, one of the things that I know about you, you, you crazy youngsters is, uh, you know, you guys are super, super amazing at, at, at typing and texting fast and, and, and social media, but don't lose your communication skills, right? Uh, know how to talk on a phone. Uh, it's coming back. We now use, believe it or not, those devices, not only for texting, but we now have to talk on them again because uh, we don't get to do it face-to-face -face in, in, a, in a conference room anymore. Um, know how to follow up, know how to send, you know, send your thank you notes, know how to know how to communicate with folks and have a dialogue, not just a long way communication, a two way communication. Uh, I spend a lot more time now sending extra emails to my clients and just checking in on them because normally I would just get on a plane and go show up. I can't do that. And so I, you know, I've got to make sure I even, you know, have a calendar of, Hey, I haven't checked in with them in two weeks. I better drop them a line. Uh, my, I have to have a communication plan um, because it's super important. And the same thing with our, uh, you know, uh, with these web tools, right? Um, you know, if you haven't used the, the annotation tools in, uh, in WebEx, they're super cool. They're actually very nice, you know, your ability to, to draw. Um, we do a lot of virtual, we always have, but we're doing a lot more these days of, of virtual uh, whiteboard sessions using tools like Zoom and GoToMeeting than we ever have. Uh, because this obviously is super important uh, on how we communicate with one another. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go back here. No, I still got my eraser showing up here. Uh, let me get back out of that. Go back to my mouse. There we go. Um, collaboration. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here so we have a few minutes to, to chat. Um, collaboration, obviously, guys, doesn't change, right? But the, the, the need to stay collaborative is super important. With my team, you know, I can tell you that we, we went to daily stand-ups, 15-minute stand-ups. The team has to report in. 
we've got a pop, 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 pow. But it, part of it is, yeah, I want to know what you're doing. The other thing is, I just want to hear your voice. I want to know that you're out there. I want to see you. I want to know that, hey, I'm here to answer any questions you have, and you might have some questions for me. And you know that you have at least one 15 minutes every day that you can have that conversation. Um, uh, we, have, we also have happy hours, virtual happy hours. Every Friday, we get together, we shut down early, and we, we, we have beers together. And it's like, guys, congratulations. We did it. We made it another week. Cheers. Uh, see you on Monday, right? Um, so it's not just collaborating in the, the raw sense of creativity and doing what we do. It's making sure that we stay balanced and healthy and, and engage and have, have conversations. I also, what's crazy about, this is one crazy thing about the pandemic. I would tell you if we were having this conference call uh, uh, a year ago, even nine months ago, I would not see you guys on video. We wouldn't be using the video is my, right? I see Griffin shaking his head. Um, we would use, you'd hear my voice. Uh, the pandemic has somehow miraculously forced us to turn our cameras on. Uh, and all of a sudden it's changed the experience. Would you guys agree? Definitely. Right? Uh, that didn't exist. I can tell you guys, I've been doing web meetings for 20 years and one out of 10 meetings, one out of 20, we would turn our videos on. Now it's reversed. If you don't, right, you know, well, maybe I should. Um, and I, am I getting left out because I, I'm not, you know, visible. But guess about for designers, it's super important. We want to see Griffin, you smile, right? We want to see you shake your head. We want to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down, right? That's super important in the way we communicate and collaborate. Uh, so that actually is another positive thing to come from a pandemic, which is bizarre because, like I said, it's hard to find positive things coming from that. Here's number seven, crew, um, and you're doing it right now. And congratulations, uh, your competition, the other C, uh, your other, the other, your peers are not here, and you are. Um, it's keeping connections. You guys all need internships. You all need, especially if you're juniors, yes. uh, hell or high water, guys. Fight the hell or high water. You gotta, you gotta fight to do it. Um, and don't let, oh, damn, the pandemic, oh, woe is me. Screw that, boys and girls. Uh, you got to get in there. You got to find ways. Um, you got to connect. You got to keep those connections alive. Uh, IDSA is your friend. I've been IDSA for 35 years. I've uh, been on the board for probably 15 of those. Um, uh, you know, use your connections, make connections, um, you know, Take your career seriously and 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 your relationships seriously. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to. I want a job. You know, that's not confidence. But make friends, right? Ask questions. Um, go start start low and slow and build build those connections. Um, it, 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 you will separate from the competition. Your competition are your buddies, are your peers. Uh, unfortunately, right. Uh, You've got to you've got to make you've got to make links in in, in the COVID world, right? It's 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 a lot even harder. It, it it pains me. I, I you would find me at every district conference um, for the last twenty years in IDSA. Now we've actually eliminated, or we those have kind of uh, phased out. But I called it my farm club. I would go in and look for the next you know year's uh, recruits at the district conferences. Um, those aren't there anymore. That actually was pre-COVID. I actually wore those guys, but. But what are new ways for you to to get recognized and be seen and your work be seen and all your seven C's be be highlighted? Um, those are things, you know, I really want to highlight. The other thing that I would tell everybody is whether you know it or not, you're like, oh, no, I'm in design school. Uh, one of the things I always leave people with is every all of us are in sales, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, right? You're all in sales. Um, even you're like, well, I hate sales. I'm not a salesperson. Even I sell every day, not to just sell projects, but I sell the work we do, right? We've got to sell people on our ideas, sell people on our concepts, sell people on our solutions. We've got to convince them that we have done our seven C's and that, that it all matters. Uh, so that's, that's a big part of what, uh, what comes together on the seven C's. So again, just to highlight them again, creativity, curiosity, confidence, commitment, communications, collaboration, and connection. And I can tell you that uh, if you put all those together, uh, 32 later, years later, you can continue to sit behind that that uh, that virtual uh, or that drafting table. Uh, in this case, it's more digital now than it was back in the day, but uh, you can keep doing it, right? And uh, I can't think of anything that uh, is, is a cooler career than than the the one you guys are are studying to be in. So with that. Uh, I thank you for your time and effort and energy to be here today. Um, we've got just a few minutes left and I'll answer any questions you might have. Did you guys have fun?
So inspiring. Um, I've been to two of these lunch and learns. So shout out to Whitney. This has just been a great um, initiative. Both of them have been absolute grand slams. Um, I mean, for us, we're in such like a little bit of a bubble with like three week project all virtual. And so it's really exciting to see, um, you know, where where our careers can take us with these larger projects and, and really getting out there and, and uh, seeing things come to market is just really exciting. Thanks, Griffin. Appreciate that. My, uh, my team actually put together a video. I, if we had more time, I knew we'd use the hour up real quick. Um, my team put together uh, for my 30th kind of anniversary, they put together a little seven minute video of kind of my career of just pictures from our time together and all the projects we've been on together. Uh, maybe sometimes we get back together again. I can show you the video if you want to see it. Uh, I didn't want to bore you with it today because I knew I was going to throw a bunch of stuff at you and I d didn't pile it on because sometimes I folks might lose interest, but uh, if you have an interest, I'll, I'll play that for you someday. I have a, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, so say, say I'm also interested in design consultancy. Um, is that something that you can like go into right out of school or, you know, is that something you should probably have some field research and like actual experience in before having, you know, an understanding of other, you know, other product design realms? Excellent question. I can tell you that I was in design consultancy before I actually graduated uh, college. Uh, I worked for a design agency called Design Lab there in Lawrence, Kansas, which I was very fortunate. I had my career personally, I, again, timing, I won't go into details, but I got a lot of, I actually was kind of instrumental in getting CAD early on, uh, early adopter kind of thing. So I got hired in to a small firm there in Lawrence and uh, uh, actually designed some speakers for Martin Logan uh, and some other clients while we were in Design Lab, while I was going to school in 88 to 92. Uh, so I, I'm happy to say I got to be a consultant even before I had my degree, um, uh, and I was working full time uh, there. So I was on kind of the eight year plan, if you're wondering. I, it took me a long time to get to school because I was kind of doing it full time, doing it. Which, but I I, I knew I wasn't going to pass it up. I, right, I, I, hell or high water, I was keeping that job. Um, but uh, then I went right into a company called uh, Douglas Lobby Industrial Design, which became Ignition, and I worked there for almost 14 years as well. Uh, right out of school and uh, and yeah we hire we actually hire uh, people right out of school uh, with a degree um, in fact my, my last designer which his name's Corbin Leach he's he's a rock star he's kick ass came from Auburn uh, Corbin still had four hours left to, to graduate and uh, we snagged him as an intern and uh, we worked out a deal where um, uh, he you know we actually he actually signed with us he signed on before uh, he had to go back to Auburn and finish that one class, and then he came back. But he, we actually gave him the job before he even um, left. And uh, no, in fact, yeah. You, but again, uh, you got to, you got to, you got to have the angle, right? You got to sell in um, why you're going to be of value. Uh, you know, I will say that you know your sketchability, your ability to sketch and communicate is incredibly strong. Uh, so hopefully, that's something that that you guys are comfortable with. If not, continue to work on those on those basic tools because that's where we throw you in the fire to start, right? It's like, okay, you know, yeah, uh, crank, you right? Can or can't. Yeah, um, get in the game. Um, uh, if we had more time, I'd talk about KU basketball. I'm a huge you know, <laughs> basketball fan. Uh, but, you know, I talk about, you know, I get to be Bill Self, I get to be the coach, but my team, I've got, I've got, I've got uh, freshmen and I've got seniors on my team. And but when I call you into the game, I'm expecting everybody to take the shot if they see, it, see an open, you know, uh, an open shot, uh, they take it right. But sometimes you're playing offense, sometimes you're playing defense. But at the end of the day, guys, we got to get points on the board, and we got to score, we got to win because we don't win, we don't get to come back and do it again for that brand. And that sucks because uh, we put a lot of effort in, 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 you know, you saw those brands. We're very proud of being a very small company having uh, big responsibilities for big brands. And, um, but we want to come back, we want to do it again. And I'm happy to say those brands you saw on the, on the screen earlier. Uh, they've been with us for 10 plus years, many of them. Um, they come back, right? But that's because my team knows how to take the shot and win the game. Yeah, that's an awesome metaphor. <laughs> Great question, Seth. Thank you. Guys, uh, I, I, I love you guys. Uh, again, Rock Chalk Jayhawk. Um, I, I am a huge fan of, of uh, obviously, design um, and uh obviously a huge fan of the University of Kansas. Uh, I will do anything I can do to help you. Uh, I, again, I, I assure you that um, that uh, you guys are all uh, um, recognized in my book uh, because you're here. 
um, and go tell your classmates they, uh, they screwed up and missed out. Um, and show up, Whitney's working really hard to do the, put these together. Uh, make, continue to show up and, and, and learn stuff, guys. This is that connection, this is the seventh C. Um, so this is, seems like Whitney does all the hard work. You guys just have to show up. How cool is that? Uh, congratulations, Whitney. Thank you so much for, for your efforts here. Um, I'm really proud of you. This is exactly what the University of Kansas needs to be doing in the, in the design program. Um, someday I, I look forward to, to maybe coming back and, and seeing um, a couple hundred people on this, on this call. Uh, um, this is super important to all of you guys and uh, keep supporting Whitney and her initiatives here. This is super, super cool and super fun. Um, so I can't tell you how much I'm honored to be here with you guys. Um, it, it really means a lot to me to be, to come back. Uh, I got a lot of pride to come back and talk to my alma mater uh, 30 plus years later. It, 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 it just warms my heart to be here with you guys on a snowy day. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, like I said, I will, I will do everything I can to help uh, you guys in your career. If, if you guys pull, if you guys are committed to the seven C's here, I'll, I'll do what I can to help. Awesome. Well, Brian, thank, thank you, so you again so much for your time. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, and have a really wonderful rest of your Monday. Stay warm. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, tell everybody we say hello. Uh, follow us on Instagram, both uh, Into Innovation and Project Bonfire. We'd love to have you guys follow us. Uh, and then, like I said, uh, don't be strangers and, and stay connected. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you. All right, crew. Enjoy the week. Bye-bye.